Well, thank you, Bill, and uh, thank you, David, and Al, and all the team that uh, has put this event together. It uh, has been very encouraging for me to see uh, the work involved, but also see the results and uh, how this movement is progressing. So I think we ought to give all those folks a round of hand. Now, as we come to this time of conclusion, I have found it to be an enriching experience as we reflected upon those pioneers of the faith and work, many of whom I knew. And uh, it has been sobering and stimulating as we've listened and learned from each other of the challenges, the growth opportunities before us as we basically take God out of the pew on Sunday and bring him to work with us on Monday. As I say this, I'm reminded of words that have already been mentioned, words of the Apostle Paul uh, to the Corinthians when he said, all this is for God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Therefore, we are to be ambassadors of Christ with God making his appeal through us. Now, for those of us who spend much of our life working in the marketplace or in some other so-called secular activity, such as a doctor or nurse or serving in an elected or administrative role in government or teaching in a public school, we know that many of the people we have worked with have never realized the joy of being reconciled to God. But we also know that every one of them have been created in the image and likeness of God with dignity and worth and their own fingerprint of potential. Each one of them is an immortal soul that will live beyond this life. They represent the only thing in our work that has eternal value. They should be the focus of this movement. In my judgment, they are the soul of the movement. It was C.S. Lewis who reminded us that there are no ordinary people. You've never met a mere mortal. Nations, cultures, arts, civilizations, their life is to ours as the life of a gnat. But it is the immortals whom we joke with, work with, marry, snub, and exploit. As ambassadors for Christ in our work, it's important for us to be productive, to excel in what we do, to be honest and ethical, to be examples for others to follow, to learn how to affirm our faith without imposing it, to raise the question of God in a way that will engage others, to serve those we lead and in so doing to assume the responsibility for the person they're becoming in their work as well as what they're doing to always be prepared to provide the reason for our hope that is within us with gentleness and respect. As we close our time together, can we agree that our work, whatever it is, can be a calling of God? Yes, even described in our evangelical church language as a full-time Christian ministry. Can we expect more teaching on this subject in our churches, from our seminaries, from our Christian educational institutions? Can we learn more from those who have and are integrating, as David reminded us, the claims of their faith with the demands of their work? Now, as I ask this, as I ask this question, for me, most of my learning on this subject came not from 
by church, not from the Christian college I attended, but from my predecessors at Service Master. As Christians and as leaders in business, they were committed to serving others as they served their master. Living their faith was an important prerequisite to sharing their faith. Our founder, Marion Wade, back in 1946 when our company was founded, basically put it this way, I can't leave God in the pew on Sunday. I've got to take him to work with me on Monday. It's got to affect how I run the business. It's got to affect how I serve customers. It's got to affect how I treat people who I'm working with. That later evolved into our four corporate objectives. To honor God in all we do, to help people develop, to pursue excellence, and to grow profitably. For us, those first two objectives were end goals. The second two were means goals. They all went together, but in that order. I used to remind uh, folks at Service Master when I was teaching, you can't come to work today and say I'm going to honor God and I don't care about making money. Nor can you say I want to make money today and I don't care about developing people. They have to fit. And I think they not only have to fit in the context of a business, but in the context of life, if I may digress a minute on the whole question of profit. Do you realize that applies to everything we do? Now, most of you tomorrow will be going to church. Most of you will be sitting in a building. That building wouldn't be there without profit. So worship it, welcome it, thank, it. thank for it that it was there. The capital generation is necessary for every organization. If you're running a not-for-profit and you're spending more than you're taking in, you're about ready to move down the road to bankruptcy. The same thing is true with your family. There has to be a generation of income beyond expenses or bankruptcy will occur, except for maybe our federal government. <laughs> Now, we didn't use that first objective as a basis of exclusion. In fact, it was the reason for our promotion of diversity, because we recognized that different people with different beliefs were all part of God's world. As a business firm, we wanted to excel at serving customers and generating profit, creating value for our shareholders. If we didn't want to play by these rules, we didn't belong in the ball game. But as I've just mentioned, the ball game is much broader than business or the marketplace. But we also tried to encourage an environment where the workplace could be an open community, where the question of a person's moral and spiritual development and the existence of God and how one related the claims of his or her faith with their work were issues of discussion Yes, even sometimes debate and learning and understanding. We considered the people of our firm as the soul of the firm. It did not mean everything was done right. We had our share of mistakes. We sometimes failed and did things wrong. But because of a stated standard and a reason for that standard, we typically could not hide our mistakes. They were flushed out regularly in the open for correction, and in some cases, for forgiveness. And leaders could not protect themselves at the expense of those they were leading. The process of seeking understanding of these objectives at all levels of the organization was a never-ending task. It involved matters of the heart as well as the head, and was not susceptible to standard management techniques or implementation of measurement. We found that the community of work could become fertile ground for raising this question of God, for understanding and acceptance of his redeeming love in one's life. Now, one of the best ways I've found to engage 
the people I worked with was to seek to serve as I led, to reflect the principles that Jesus was teaching his disciples when he washed their feet, including that no leader was greater or had a self-interest more important than those being led. And seeking to so serve the truth of what I said could be measured by what I did. Servant leadership has been a continuing learning experience for me. It has not come naturally. The first thing I had to understand was what it meant to walk in the shoes of the people I would lead. This was a lesson that I would learn as I first joined the Service Master Senior Management Team and spent the first two months of my Service Master career out cleaning the floors and doing the maintenance work and other work that our service workers did in serving customers. In so doing, I was beginning to understand what would be my dependence and responsibility to the people I would lead. Little did I realize then that this, was, this would ultimately involve over 200,000 people as we grew to serve 10 million customers in 45 different countries. Later on in my career, as I became CEO of the firm, the faces of those service workers would often flash across my mind as I was making those inevitable judgments between the rights and wrongs of running a business. The integrity of my words and actions had to pass their scrutiny. Otherwise, I was deceiving myself and those I was committed to serve. Now, as we developed this in our business, it was a way of God teaching us to love him on the horizontal as we engage the world that he so loves. After one of my trips to China, I received this note from one of our employees who had been traveling with me as an interpreter. Here's what Zhu Zhang said. When I grew up in China, religions were forbidden and Mao's book became our Bible. When I was five or six years old, I could recite Mao's quotations and even use them to judge and lecture the kids in the neighborhood. Mao said, serve the people. Leaders should be public servants. This coincides with some of the service master's moral standards. But when I think deeply, I see a difference that makes one work successfully and the other collapse fatally. It must be the starting point of service master to honor God and that every individual has been created in his image with dignity and worth. Service master is designed to be a big tall tree with strong roots which penetrates extensively to almost every corner of a person's daily life. It's still growing in mine and I'm still learning. Zhu is a thinking person. She felt accepted and respected in her work environment. She was confronted with life choices that went beyond doing the job and earning a living, choices about who she was becoming and how she could relate to God. She was growing and developing an understanding of herself and the purpose and meaning for her life. For me, the world of business has been a channel for fulfilling and living and sharing my faith. A channel that reached from the janitor's closet in Saudi Arabia to the great hall of the people in Beijing, China, from sweeping the streets in Osaka, Japan, to ringing the bell on the New York Stock Exchange. The marketplace provided a wonderful opportunity for me to embrace and engage those who did not believe the way I did but whom God loved and who by my words and actions needed to see the reality of that love. Now the global marketplace provides a wonderful opportunity for the followers of Jesus to live and share their faith. In business, there is a common language of performance that crosses secular, cultural, and religious barriers. When there's performance, people listen. And yes, as some people listen, they respond to the redemptive message of God's love. Now, as David has mentioned, and I want to refer back to Joshua 
as he came to the close of his leadership when he said, but if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourself this day whom you will serve. But as for me, in my house, we will serve the Lord. And to remind us what that word serve is in Hebrew, abada, to serve, to worship. And what else was it? Work. Work. That's right. All those things can come together in our life. And, uh, and it's a wonderful experience as it does. God has called each of us to be in the world but not part of it. He has called us to be excellent in what we do, whether we call it a job, profession, or ministry. Now etched in stone on the floor of the chapel of Christ Church College in Oxford University are the words written by Jonathan Locke 300 years ago. He said, I know there is truth opposite falsehood, and that it may be found if people will search for it is worth the seeking. Who will we serve this day and tomorrow? Will we be a vehicle for the use of God in our workplace to help people find the truth of our faith that is not only worth the seeking, but has an eternal value. As we describe the faith and work as a movement, may we never forget that it is the soul of the people we work with and serve. Now, I realize I only have one second left, <laughs> but I will close with these lines from T.S. Eliot's choruses from Iraq. What life have you if you not have life together? Is there no life that is not in community? And no community not lived in praise of God? And now you live dispersed on ribbon roads, and no man knows or cares who is his neighbor, unless his neighbor makes too much disturbance. And the wind shall say, here were decent, godless people. Their only monument, the asphalt road and a thousand lost golf balls. Can you keep the city that the Lord keeps not with you? A thousand policemen directing traffic and not tell you why you come or where you go? When the stranger says, what is the meaning of this city? Do you huddle close together because you love each other? What will you answer? We all dwell together to make money from each other? Is this a community? Oh, my soul, be prepared for the coming of the stranger. Be prepared for him who knows how to ask questions. We have wonderful opportunities today to reach a world that is unreached, represented in many respects by the marketplace. And yes, I would like to have the church embrace this much more than they have. But let me close with this thought as I was sit sitting and listening today, this morning especially. The marketplace is a battlefield. There's no question about it. At least I found it so. And I will tell you that I looked forward to every Sunday morning to come to church and to have my spirit renewed by my pastor, my shepherd. I'm thankful that he did it. I'm thankful that he communicated to me and helped me worship and renew my spirit before I had to go back out in the battlefield. And that was his job. I wish he, I wish he had understood the battlefield more. I wish he would have recognized the virtue of profit, which I could give you a sermon on, and some other things like that. But I want to tell you the most important thing in my life was he was a vehicle God used to continually renew my spirit.